Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I hope you had a wonderful weekend and are ready to um, talk books, listen uh, to an interview about books, uh, you know, do all those wonderful, fun things that come with a book review podcast. I have, as usual, on Tuesdays, I have an interview. This time I am interviewing Natasha Dean, author of the young adult book, In the Key of Nira Ghani. This is a really delightful book. I so enjoyed uh, the story, the characters, the um the, the humor, the the poignancy with which the story is told. There's just so many layers to this book that I really loved. And I really really loved talking to Natasha over the weekend when we had our interview. Um I'm not going to apologize for the amount of giggling that there is in this interview because it was seriously a lot of fun, but I will warn you ahead of time, there's a lot of giggling in this episode, <laughs> so just be prepared. We very much enjoyed each other's company. Uh, here is the description of In the Key of Niragani. Niragani has always dreamed of becoming a musician. Her Guyanese parents, however, have big plans for her to become a scientist or doctor. Nira's grandmother and her best friend, Emily, are the only people who seem to truly understand her desire to establish an identity outside of the one imposed on Nira by her parents. When auditions for jazz band are announced, Nira realized, realizes it's now or never to convince her parents that she deserves a chance to pursue her passion. However, finding her place in the world is trickier than she imagined. As Nira navigates new friendships and a budding romance, the gap between her parents' expectations and what she wants grows. Can Nira find a way to have it all, or will she be forced to choose family obligations over being true to herself? That is, as I said, the description of In the Key of Nira Ghani. So, you know, high school is hard enough as it is. It's even harder when you, uh, I mean... <sighs> We all have our own reasons for feeling like we don't fit in, and Nira certainly feels that way as the daughter of immigrants. Uh, she is one of the few brown students in her school, and she encounters a lot of uh, questions, comments, some of them well-intentioned, others not well-intentioned. And she she struggles to find her place in this school, in society. She does have her best friend, Emily, and she has her grandmother, so she does have that support to start her out with. But she really does have to find her way through the story. She has to find her way um, in her relationship with her parents, in her relationship w relationships with her peers. How is she going to be Nira? Um within those different worlds within the world of uh, of home where her uh, where, where she says it's um she calls it little guyana uh you know it's it's like this it's it's very different from the canadian society around her and she has to figure out how to be nira at home she has to figure out how to be nira at school she has to be figure out how to be nira in the greater context of her a larger family that lives around her and it's hard you know it's hard for all of us to figure out how to be ourselves so this is a wonderful exploration of that journey for one young woman in this context so i am going to let you listen to natasha describe this book and what um, prompted her to tell this story so here is my interview with natasha dean about her new book in the key of niragani hi natasha welcome to the podcast Hello, Sarah. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for hosting me today. 
I am happy to have you here, and we are here to talk about your book. Uh, it's called In the Key of Niragani, and we are going to talk about that soon, but if you could just start off by telling us a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Oh, um, so the grown-up version is that I am a kid's teen and adult writer. I write in uh, quite a few genres, like fantasy, mystery, suspense, and uh, as well as writing for kids, I write for kids who love to read as well as kids who um, sometimes find reading a bit of a chore. Uh, and when I'm not writing, I visit schools and libraries and have like writing workshops and, and just sort of talk to people and help them find the stories that are sort of living inside of them. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the actual bio of me is Hey, I'm Natasha, and I love cupcakes, and I will cross the street to pet a dog. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I would be, I would be easily kidnapped. He'd be like, Hey, I have a cupcake. Can you help me find my dog? And I'd be like, Sure, I can. You don't look at all oh. scary. <laughs> no, and that that unmarked windowless van is not at all suspicious. Yeah. I'm yeah, I'm sure it has no windows for like environmental reasons, right? right. And. <laughs> And, and the much splattered license plate. That's that's not weird. That's not totally <laughs> not weird. weird at all. No, <laughs> not okay, even a little you, bit. You maybe shouldn't have said that on the podcast because now people will know and they will, you know, <laughs> they'll try to kidnap you. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So oh, it'll yeah. cost you two cupcakes now, people too. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, and a really cute dog. Really well. Yeah, I'm a sucker because all dogs are cute to me. So exactly, even the silly ones. <laughs> yes, I agree. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about the book. Um, okay. And uh, we could talk about kidnapping you all day, but uh, we should probably <laughs> talk about the book uh, since it's not the kidnapping podcast. Um, what can you can you tell? Uh, excuse me. Can you just give a brief overview of it? Uh, so in the key of Nira Ghani is all about Nira, and she's a Guyanese kid. And she comes from a family of immigrants. And uh, the joke when you're uh, a brown kid raised by an immigrant family is your parents, you know, tell you you can be anything you want, any kind of lawyer, any kind of doctor, <laughs> any kind of accountant. Um, and Nira doesn't want any of that. She really, really wants to be a professional musician. She wants to be, uh, be able to play the trumpet as her sort of life goal, career goal. Uh, so the book is just like this funny, um, kind of story, uh, charming, endearing, about this girl partnering up with her grandmother and her friends to just sort of like get her parents to come on board uh, to let her be who she wants to be. And through the course of it, she sort of finds out some very surprising things about the people around her and about herself. I, and I'm, I'm really pleased because Nira has made a few book lists and she's a junior library guild selection and as well she is a forest of reading red maple nominee this year for the 2020 awards um and that's through the ontario library association so i'm i'm very pleased with the fact that nira and her story are really connecting to readers yeah that's awesome definitely well earned um what was your original inspiration for the story so weirdly enough and for all the the young and emerging writers out there, Nira, um, Nira did not start off being that story. It was actually originally meant to be a, um, a middle grade story that was science fiction based. And mm. I wrote two different versions of that story. So I think around 80,000 words and then realized that, no, <laughs> it's not working <laughs> at all. Uh, and then I had to uh, go back and do the thing that sort of freaks me out, which is because I'm a, a very much, I'm an outliner and a plotter. And um, I had to sit at the blank page and let the story come instead of forcing the story. And Nira was the voice that I heard once I calmed myself down and, and stopped trying to force stuff. Mm -hmm. She was the, she was the story that came out. Nice. And what is it about writing um, young adults that appeals to you as an author? Uh, I, well, see, I feel like I'm really lucky because I get to write for different audiences. So, um, you know, for little guys, I really love it because their their love of what they find funny 
is, <laughs> is awesome. And, um, you know, just they will go along with you on the most out there storylines as long as you can keep their attention. And for young adults, I really like it because I feel like there's a lot of questions we have when we're sort of in that age group and there's a lot of discovering ourselves and there's a lot of like really fun snark that you have as a teenager that mm -hmm. when you become an adult, it just becomes the eternal voice that you don't give that to. Um, <laughs> but when you're a teenager, you're like, hey, uh, I can I can be sarcastic and I can be funny and I can do all these things. So uh, I really like it. I like I like that push pull and I love young adult readers as well because um, it's the same kind of thing like they're 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 brave like and they're looking at the world in different ways and they're willing to experiment and you can bring that same kind of adventure into the stories that you write for them which i really i really really love you were talking about the snark a few minutes ago and that was one of my favorite things about nira is she has this very sort of dry snarky humor and she, she has the best one-liners I can't remember any of them right now because you know it's just the nature of my life but I, I loved her sense of humor yeah I know what you mean though I know because you're like I really love this thing and then people are like oh what is it that you love and you're like I uh, can't remember but I'm telling you I really <laughs> but well, it was hilarious I know, I know. you know and that's I think that's the fun thing about being a writer is uh, you know, for the, the person who reads it, they read it in real time and your characters could be really funny and really snappy. Uh, and meanwhile, you know, you know that it took you like three weeks to come up with that one line. Right. You're like, ah, oh, this, this will work, you know. Um, but yeah, I really like that she that she is kind of got that that commentary on life um, mm -hmm. because it's both kind of realistic and snarky. but Hopefully, there's that thread of optimism that we just went through. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, that went through as well. <laughs> yeah. So, it, um, what about Nira? I mean, probably part of what we've just talked about. But what what else about Nira do you think will resonate with readers, or has been resonating with readers? Uh, well, people super love Grandma, and uh, they really like the relationship with her. But I think, you know, it's funny because I think Nira resonates, and this is what I love, like, she's connecting to readers who are immigrant kids, um, who are the kids of immigrants. She connects with people who are older, people who are younger. Um, and I love that there's also people who are like, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not a person of color or I'm not an immigrant, but I really, you know, my family didn't exactly grow up with tons of money or I grew up in a school that was really clicky and I know how she feels when she feels really invisible. Uh, or, you know, I had, I had this dream and, and, you know, I, I really connect with that. So I, I really love that she's got a lot of notes and a lot of ways that she connects with people. Um, but yeah, the, the funny, um, and grandma and just her, her persistence and trying to get what it is that she wants. And then for folks who love romance, there is a romantic subplot that um, people people really like uh, the dude that she likes too. So that really works for me. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that I, I liked about the family was that, you know, her parents definitely push her, but her dad is, is always ending every argument with, you're going to end up in the gutter. <laughs> and Sarah's <laughs> always asking, you know, like, who are these kids who end up in the gutter? Where is the gutter? Have you seen them in the gutter? <laughs> Well, you know, and it's funny because, like, in my family growing up, it was all about turkeys and eagles, right? And you were always supposed to grow You were supposed to grow up to be an eagle. You weren't supposed to grow up to be a turkey. And, like, everything, like, the most simple things, my dad would be like, that's not how eagles fly. And you were like, who? <laughs> I am a human being. And this one time, I got so frustrated with my dad. And I said to him, you can't always be an eagle. Like, just... One day, one day, could I just not be a turkey for one day? And without missing a beat, my dad goes, yeah, but you better hope it's not Thanksgiving. <laughs> like, well, I'm done. I'm done. Like, no, no I was like, really? Is it, this is going to maybe be a dumb question, but is, is turkey traditional at Canadian Thanksgiving as well? It is well for yeah. There's um, turkey and I think ham is also mm -hmm. a big one. Yeah, 
Yeah, so yeah, thanks, Carol. I was just like, okay, okay, I'm done. I'm going to go study. You you win. Yeah, you you win right. to affinity. Right. Right. <laughs> what do your parents think about you being an author? Is that is that a turkey career? You know, no, it's not. Like, I, I think because uh, they were, they went into business, you know, and, and, and uh, government jobs and all those kinds of things. So they, they sort of traveled a very, I don't want to say traditional, but you know what I mean? Like a path that most people, we grow up and we go into like companies. Uh, so it took them a little bit to figure out exactly what it meant to be an author. And I think there were moments early on in my career where they were seriously worried. I had chosen the Turkey way or the gutter way. Cause it was mm-hmm. like, you know, cause I mean, when you're a writer, um, you really have to be okay and come to grips with the fact that people are going to tell you no way more than they ever tell you yes. You know, and you're going to work on these manuscripts that you love and you think will connect to people. And you've got a whole, you know, like uh, this, this is the kind of book I've written. And here's, here's all the read likes and here's how well, you know. And and people will just come back and be like, no, sorry, the agents don't want you, the editors don't want you, the publishing houses don't want you. Um, so if you want to go into writing as career, you, you have to be okay with the fact that it's just, it's not going to be like business where you get in, you work hard, and then you have this sort of upward trajectory, you know, theoretically speaking. Um, being a writer can really zigzag. And <clears throat> because it's zigzag, I think my parents in the beginning were a little bit worried that maybe I hadn't really thought it through. Um, but I give my folks a lot of credit because they saw that it really made me happy. And it was a thing that I really felt that I was here to do, the, the thing that I could do best. And so I don't know that they still understand it, but they certainly respect it. And they're very, very proud of me for, for like all of it. <laughs> Everyone, oh, my nice. dad is like, but, but nonfiction, Natasha, you can't do nonfiction. I'm like, no, I can't. No. <laughs> you know? So my poor dad's like, okay, okay, well, that, that's okay, that's okay. I'll just go read my newspapers, honey. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Thanks. Love you. Love you so much. <laughs> well, at least you can still say that <laughs> while rolling your eyes. <laughs> I think we're all going to take a second now and contemplate what it means to be a turkey versus what it means to be an eagle. And um, while you're contemplating, we're going to take our first break of the podcast when we come back more with this interview with Natasha Dean. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Still on the search of that one true love? On the limbo in this crazy world of dating, marriage, relationships. Well... Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Relationship Podcast, your one-stop podcast for everything about relationships. Welcome back to the GSNC Book Review Podcast. Before the break, Natasha was telling the story of her father always saying the thing that choices could be, you know, could you'd be a turkey or an eagle. And so hopefully you took some time to ponder what you are in life. <laughs> and um, maybe you came to some fabulous conclusion. I don't know. But we are going to go ahead and get back to the interview with Natasha. Mira has um, a, a rather special relationship with her trumpet. It's almost like another member of the family, at least to her. Um, and she's named him Georgia. <laughs> so yes. how did that part of the story come to life? You know, it's it's one of those things. And I think, you know, when, you know, when you're a writer, you write and you have a lot of things planned. But you also have to build in these, like, weird pockets of space and silence where uh, you're – the brain part of you that's not actually explicitly talking to you is still going to, is still monitoring everything you're doing. That's going to come out and like give you these cool lines and what have you. And with Georgia, um, I was writing and I just kind of heard this, like her trumpet would have a name. Like she would have, because she's so, she's so anxious about everything in her life. She's, she's worried about not making her parents happy, but at the same time really wanting to make herself happy and that, she doesn't quite fit in, in school and like there's all these things. So 
you know, the trumpet would be and playing the trumpet would be her safe space. And sort of feeling her the way I felt her, it just seemed to make sense that she would give him a name, but she wouldn't because she's not you know, a green grass is green, red flowers are red kind of kid, I couldn't see the trumpet having a green grass is green, red flowers are red kind of name either. And whenever I, you know, if you've ever heard the song Georgia, it's such a beautiful song. And it seemed to so encapsulate how she felt uh, when she was playing and how she felt with this relationship with the trumpet that it just sort of made sense that this is, this is what she was going to do. Um, if she was going to give him this name. But I think also, uh, I think that sort of came from the place uh, for me, for my writing as well. And I think for any of us, when we've been lucky enough to find the thing that lights us up, like our passion, you know, there's just this like sense of calm and this sense of love. And, you know, I have, um, I have kids and young writers and I'll ask about like, you know, how do you know if you're meant to be a writer? How do you know if you're going to be good at it? And, you know, the truth is you, you really don't know if you're going to be good at it. Like I'm a, I'm a terrible writer, but I'm really good at rewriting. Right. So mm. it's like, I'm just going to get on page and then I will just work on it until, you know, but I always say to them, you know, it's, it's, you know, when you think about the way, like you imagine yourself walking into a bookstore and there's your book and it's on the bookshelf. And I say that I'm like, hold to that memory and hold to that image because that will be the thing that encourages you. But if you want to, if you're meant to be whatever it is that you feel is your passion, think about that thing on like the worst day, you know? So for writing, it's like, you've been at this manuscript for two years, you put in however many, like, so myself, I've been, I've been working on a manuscript for two years. I wrote 80,000 words, realized it didn't work, had to burn it to the ground, start back on page one, wrote another 87,000 words, realized that didn't work, had to burn it to the ground and start all Mm -hmm. over again. And those were like really, harsh, terrible, grindy, not glamorous moments, but I would take those moments at their worst over anything else that it's best, you know? So I always say, like, I think that's where you'll know because um, when it's not fun, when it's not, you know, confetti and puppies and cupcakes, <clears throat> but you still want to do it, that's probably a really good indication that that's where you're that's the thing that's going to light you up because you're okay doing the grind and you're okay when it's not, um, when it's not this like sexy glamorous thing that you can post on Insta. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In terms of the book, was there any kind of, um, any topic that you had to do research on for it? Yes. Yeah, I did. Um, and my buddy, Stephen Fong, he is a professional trumpet player. So in the beginning, I definitely was emailing and texting him and being like, hey, does this work? Hey. And so Nira plays something called a pocket trumpet, uh, which is a smaller version of a sort of regular trumpet. And I remember going to Stephen and being like, can she, can she use this? Can she do it? You know, is there, is there something within this thing that I'm missing? And he was he was really, really helpful. I mean, I played trumpet in band in junior high, but and that was great to give me sort of like that basic level. Uh, but there were certain things that definitely, you know, you want to go and find the person who's doing that thing so you can get mm-hmm. the most accurate information and you're not sort of leading your readers wrong on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you know, I played, I played flute in junior high and high school, and so you would have been the person sitting behind me emptying your spit valve. <laughs> <laughs> so now I don't know well, who we can be friends. <laughs> in my defense, in my defense, uh, the the way my teacher set it up was the flute people were all they were in the very very front row, but the trumpet guys like we were way behind. We were like second last row. Uh, so we were behind the clarinets and, you know, yes, and we had our own special riser for the spit valve. So, <laughs> that, well, no, that was like, I couldn't do trumpet after, like, I did it for a year and I really liked it, but that was just so gross. I could never, I could never get away. And I remember Stephen being like, mostly it's condensation. I was like, yeah, but not all of it. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> not all of it. And I, I guess a whole warm air, cold metal, but no, I'm out. I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no more spit. Yes. No more spit. No. Uh, well, we had a, I, I went to a very small high school, so they're a uh, small school. I mean, I went K through 12 in one building. So, um, oh, wow. The, the band wasn't big enough to have that many rows between me and the trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. so how about, um, uh, you, you've kind of alluded to some of them, but how about uh, autobiographical elements for the book? Uh, yeah, so the barbecue scene where mom and dad are having that giant fight over the barbecue and mom almost sets fire to the house. Uh, oh my that was definitely inspired by my mom and dad. Having the... the like a very, very similar argument because my dad really wanted like the big, you know, like the grown up barbecue. And my mom had seen this like hibachi at Canadian Tire that was like $20. It was like a camping barbecue, I guess. And mm-hmm. she was like, oh, this will work. And, um, and they sort of had this back and forth. And my mom went outside because uh, she was determined to prove that it doesn't matter what it looks like, right? Like a, a barbecue is a barbecue and it will, it will make the same food. And, um, and yeah, and she had like, remember those white cubes? I don't know if they still have them now because uh, we have a propane barbecue, but there were these white cubes that she was trying to light and they wouldn't light, so she kept adding lighting fluid and um, and she couldn't get it, so she's adding like more lighter fluid and newspaper and it's me and my little brother who was I think maybe four at the time. And I remember him taking a step forward to see what my mom was doing and I just grabbed him by the back of his shirt and pulled him back and put him behind <laughs> me because I was like, no good. No good is coming out of this. And sure yeah. enough, there, there was a point where you just heard this, like, sonic boom, boom, and this, like, black cloud of smoke and fire just went, like, straight up one side of the the house. And there was this, this like, black mark. And the three of us were just staring at it in silence. And then my mom looks at me and goes, don't tell your father I did that. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, he's not going to notice? I think he's going to notice. And the worst <laughs> part of it is that summer, like our um, our job that summer uh, was because we had this like the house was, I think, built in the 1950s, maybe. So it was like wood. And we spent the entire summer sanding down this wood and painting it. And it was this older house that so just sucked paint. So it was like, I don't know, a bazillion coats of paint. And my dad had decided that uh, he wanted a white house with blue trim. And so there's like this, so it's like this bright white house now with a streak of black and my mom going like, don't, don't tell your dad that was me. And I'm like, who do you, who do you think he's going to think that, you know, like, what do you, so, and yeah, sure enough. And he was like, oh, we're going to have to, re-. and I was like, no, we are not, I know it's going to be like me and my siblings, right? It's not going to be my dad going out there. Oh, I was so annoyed with my mom, but the chicken was delicious. So I couldn't be that annoyed. <laughs> nice. nice. Um, I, I am, I was fascinated and intrigued by the part of the book that, you know, I mean, Nira is an immigrant kid she came when she was about five and so you know she's she's grown up in Canada but it's there's there's oh man I could ask you a billion questions but uh, one thing that I I loved about the book was not I mean I loved it in a way of oh my gosh people need to be smacked sometimes Uh, because (laughs) because she's brown and there's all sorts of assumptions made about her and so you know she's being asked if she's Hindu she's being asked if she's Muslim and she's so casual like no that no my grandma's Hindu no my my aunt's Muslim I mean she's got this really great eclectic family um did did that was that intentional to write it with kind of humor um in terms of those cultural differences to make them a little more um I mean you still I still want to smack the people in the book but at least I had some sympathy with Nira as well (laughs) yeah well I like within my family we are a mix of um different religions (laughs) <laughs> and different non-religions and atheists and you know and it's kind of always fascinated me that within my family where all of us are wildly opinionated and it's all you know our way in the highway <clears throat> and we will take you out of the maze to prove that we are right yet somehow we can all get along and yet in the wider world there's always this um conflict and these arguments and and it kind of makes me sad because, but on the same hand it I mean it 
it makes me really, really upset and kind of heartbroken. But at the same time, I take hope that if my family can do it, like eventually we will all be able to do it. And so from nearest perspective, I think a lot of that is certainly inspired autobiographically because Nira's from Guyana, which is in South America, and I still get asked if I'm from Ghana, which is in Africa, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, mm -hmm. and I think sometimes like we have to find that space. Um, and and I think as a person of color, I'm always sort of like listening very carefully to understand if it is prejudice, racism, ignorance, or if because Guyana is such a small country and nobody ever talks about it, that people like, you know, our brains sometimes just sort of make these connections where, you know, they hear Guyana, but their brain goes, oh, I don't think, no, that must be Ghana. Do you know what I mean? So they're not actually being mm -hmm. jerks. It's just, you know, so, um, and yeah, I mean, you got to, you, you have to find the humor in, in sort of those moments because at least for me, because then if I can find the humor, I can make my way out of it. But if I stay in that irritation or that anger or that, like, you've got to be kidding me, it's 2019. Mm -hmm. Why are you asking me what my first language is? You know, like, I, right. I see that you are blonde with blue eyes. I'm not, and you know, I'm not assuming that you are Danish. I'm not asking you if you wear lederhosen. I'm not. Do you know what I mean? Because <laughs> maybe you should. So it's, I know. Right? Well, I mean, oh, right. So yeah, um, it, it's. I think sometimes it's really important for us to figure out where people's intentions and motivations come from, so then we can respond appropriately. Whether that is smacking them down, um, standing up for ourselves, or giving them that space to be like, I think you heard me wrong. I didn't say Ghana. I said Guyana, and that's in South America. And then giving them that minute um, for them to then come back to tell me in their response where they're falling on that line. And I, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's mm -hmm. where I was trying to go with, with Nira as well, is that um, I don't want her to always have the angry response, but I do sometimes need her to have the angry response. Do you know what I mean? Because right. yeah. that, that's human, right? That's human, that's human life and, and being in this world. So let's go ahead and take our second and final break of the podcast. When we come back, the conclusion of this interview with author Natasha Dean. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the DSMC Book Review Podcast. Um, I'm speaking today with author Natasha Dean about her new young adult book, In the Key of Niragani. Let's go ahead and get back to that interview. Are there any of your other novels that you would like to talk about at this point? Oh, um, well, I mean, <laughs> I, I would love to talk about all of them. Uh, of course. Because right I mean that's that's kind of the the nature of writers where we're like oh my gosh I finished a book somebody wanted it um but no I think what I'll do is I will encourage listeners if they would like to know more about my work to by all means please come and and visit my website at Natasha Dean and Dean has two e's 
um, so natashadean.com um, and you will see the books I have for the little guys and the books that I have for the big guys and the horror stuff and the mystery stuff and the sports stuff and hopefully there will be a book there that you like or you know a book that sparks your interest to go look at other books by other amazing authors that are out there in the world so nice thank you and um <laughs> what are you working on now if you can talk about it <laughs> just my sanity and mental health <laughs> counts yes okay. yes it does i mean i <laughs> Uh, I'm so that one novel I was telling you about where you know put together there's been probably over 200,000 words written on this one book that just does not want to work and it does not want to be done and um and I think it can be you know I I read a stat one time that said something like 85% of people who start writing a book will never finish and I really understand that because I think it's one of those things where we don't give ourselves credit for what a difficult thing we're about to do you know I mean you've got your story in your head it's going to take you 30 seconds to imagine it you know um, five minutes or 10 minutes to jot down the big points but then once you start transcribing the thing that's in your head to the page it takes so much longer and you need so much patience and it's so easy for us to go into really negative mental talk and tell ourselves that if we were smarter, if we were better at it, <clears throat> somehow it would go faster, somehow this thing would be perfect, somehow whatever it is that we do to beat ourselves up when things are difficult. Um, but for emerging writers and for young writers, I would say to you, you know, writing by nature is just one of those things that seems easy when you are reading that book, but is much harder to create. So it's really important for us to like be patient to understand not everything on that page is going to stay, not everything on that page is going to be glorious. And in order to be a really great writer, we have to be willing to be really bad writers and to write all the stuff because we may not keep it, but it's going to get us to the stuff that we do keep. Um, and then to also for the writers out there to just don't ever compare your work in progress with somebody's finished book. You know, so mm -hmm. when I look at Nira, Nira went through probably 12 to 14 different edits from me. Uh, and then I sent it out to, uh, you know, my fellow authors that I really trusted to give me opinions. And that was probably, and that was like five different people. So I, so I do like 12, 14 edits on myself. I come back, five different people with five different edits so I go through their work so that's what 19 depending on how you're doing the math like 17 19 edits now send it off to my agent she does another two to three edits to make sure that this is where we want then it gets sold then it's another you know three or four edits and then it's like onto the copywriter it's onto the proofreader um so you know at any point in time that you're taking a book off the bookshelf that book has gone through at the very least 10 edits at most, like way more than 10. Uh, and it should read smooth and it should read polished because it's gone through a lot of hands and it's gone through a lot of people who care about that story. So if you, when you're on your first draft, you know, that's, that's okay for it to be messy. It's okay for it not to make sense. Don't, don't compare your thing that you are working on and you have passion and love for uh, to something that is now a finished product. You have obviously been writing for a while because you have many books out. Uh, is it something that you always wanted to do? I mean, I know you had to kind of talk your parents into it, but what, what was your path in or in terms of becoming a, a published writer? You know, I it's interesting. I when I was a kid, I went through wanting to be a lawyer, wanting to be a judge, wanting to be a teacher, wanting to be a psychologist, um, wanting to be a communication specialist for the government, like all these different things that that we sort of dream up when we're kids. And I think it just sort of came down to like, I just wanted to be happy, you know, and, and that deep, that deep level hum happy where you're like happy in your bones. Um, and there was just a point, I think I was in university. I just gotten out of university and I was in that really awkward phase where you have too much experience and too much education for like this whole level of jobs, but you do not have enough 
experience and enough education for this level of job. So you're in this weird spot where it's like, you know, you can work hard, you know, you can be a really good um, contributing member to whatever company it is that you're applying to, but they're not sure if one day you're just going to leave them because this job isn't, you know, it isn't taking advantage of your education and your experience. Uh, so they're kind of hesitant, but then also they don't necessarily know if you have enough of whatever it is they're looking for to hire you on. Um, and it was in that space where I had just sort of started writing as a way to kind of keep my cool and to um, make myself happy because, you know, I mean, writing is, is a lot like job hunting. Like you have to, you get a lot of those no's. And for anyone who's gone out with their resume and, you know, they're setting out and filling out the forms online and all this kind of stuff. And you just kind of wait and then you hear like, no, we don't want you. No, we don't want you. Um, so the writing started off as a hobby um, because it made me happy. And then I read a really terrible book and I thought either this author doesn't respect her readers or uh, writing is much harder than I think it is. So I thought, well, cool, big mouth, put your money, you know, put your money where your mouth is. Can you, can you finish a book? You've been dabbling, but can you actually do this? And then could you go out and get it published? And it, it was just like a goal that I set for myself and something that I tried and, and fast forward however many years later and I'm a professional writer. Um, and I was right on both counts with that particular book. She did not respect her readers but writing is much harder than we give it credit for. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you take the time to read instead of writing, what are your go-to authors or genres? Oh, I, I don't have any go-to authors per se. I, I kind of like going around and just grabbing books because the title looks interesting or the cover or the premise. And then, you know, what I do is I, um, I try to read, you know, I give myself the first five pages and if they can keep me on the first five pages, I'll keep reading. And if not, then I recognize I'm not the reader for this book. Um, and then I will put it back so that someone who is the reader will be able to find it. Uh, but I really love, I love mysteries. I love puzzles. And I'm also a sucker for any book that can make me laugh, like anything that's happy. Um, my for sure books that I will not do is anything. And I'm, I don't even know if I should admit this, but I'm totally the person that will read the ending of a book before I read the beginning. And it's cause it's like, it's, I'm, I'm a slow reader. So if I'm going to invest a ton of time, I need to know that these characters are going to come out on the other side in a way that I can, I can get behind. And, and again, it comes back to like the kinds of things that we like to read and the kinds of, personalities we have right like not every book is going to fit us it doesn't mean the book is bad it just means that we're not the fit for that book and for me um as a kid you know you'd have to read these books for school that you know you're going through and you're going through these characters are getting their heads kicked in at any given moment and you're like okay but something good will happen and at the end it's like no nothing good happens to <laughs> anybody and it would just make me so mad because i thought you know my life, like every, like life in general is hard enough where we get like kicked in the head just every day. So the thing that I want to do in my spare time is not reading yet another book where someone gets their head kicked in. I need to read the book where the person like gets some kind of happy ending. Even if it's not a Hollywood happy ending, like it ends on some kind of positive note. Um, and then for sure, it, it can't be any books where something terrible happens to the animals. And, mm. and I, started, I started reading the ends of books uh, when I was, um, I think, grade four, you know, grade four, grade five. And my librarian at the school was like, oh, have you read where the red fern grows? You'll love it. You'll love dogs, right? You'll love it. It's so great. And I got to the end and I just wanted to like take like I was so angry that this was the book that she thought would make me happy you know and I was like what and I just uh -oh. yeah so after that I was like no no I need if if you know so but yeah I remember that with um you know Game of Thrones on TV and we were watching the first couple of episodes and then uh the point where they found the wolf puppies 
And he said to my husband, oh. I was like, no, I'm out. I'm out. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. And he's like, why? I'm like, there is no good happening with these puppies. Like, trust me. That was a good you call. Know? That was a good call. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, how do you know? And I was like, because everything is bleak and terrible and harsh. And now you have these, like, furry, beautiful things that are the symbol of innocence and hope. It's not happened. No. <laughs> so, yeah. So, he... He uh, he watched the show without me, <laughs> and yeah, totally. You're right. It was a couple of years where he's like, "Yeah, that was that was a good call." I don't know that it was, was really good able to, like pick you up off the couch after. And I was like, yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> Um, you mentioned your website uh, earlier, Natasha Dean with two e's dot com. Yes. Uh, are there any other places where people can find you, like social media? Oh, I'm on Instagram and Twitter, and my handle is at Natasha underscore Dean. Um, Twitter mostly, Instagram, if I think I have something <laughs> noteworthy to post in terms of a picture. Uh, but, you know, I, I try really hard to recognize that while I think all the photos of my furry family is super cute, um, I can't flood my Insta with it. So, um, <laughs> come on. So, <laughs> All right. Thank you. And um, we have talked about many fabulously awesome things. Um, some of them funny, some of them not funny, but uh, are there anything, <laughs> any, I mean, not funny in a good way. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> Is there anything that we haven't touched on that you would like to mention about your books or writing? No, not really. But I will say to those of you who want to be writers or those of you who have um, some kind of dream or some quiet, quiet little thing inside you that says, boy, I wonder if we could do this thing. Uh, I encourage you with all of my heart to go out and do it. You know, um, you don't have to do it all in one day. You don't have to get it all done like in a week, you know, but whatever it is that you think it is that you want to do, whatever makes your heart happy, um, I encourage you to sit down and figure out a way how you can how you can do it. And so for writers, like I'm, I feel very very blessed and very lucky that I get to do this full time. Um, but before I was doing it full time, it was you know writing at my desk or getting up early and putting in the words because I realized if I came home, you know, by the end of the day I was so tired I just couldn't even think about it. Um, and you know. Even if you write half a page a day, eventually you will have that that manuscript that you want, you know, and if you want to, you know, run 5K, even if you just start by walking down your driveway, it's still better than not walking down your driveway. So you can do it. You can do whatever it is that, that you want to do. All right. Well, thank you so much. I had so much fun chatting with you. And, um, me the too. You were, this was so great. Thank you for hosting me. Yeah, this was lovely. This was fun. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and the book is uh, In the Key of Niragani, and it is available now, right? That's right. It is. It That's is. Right. All right. Thanks again. Thank you again to Natasha for taking time out of her weekend to talk to me about In the Key of Niragani. If you think there was a lot of giggling in that episode, you should know how much I cut out. I really did. Um, there was, there was editing that happened in this episode because not all of that conversation needed to, it was just for us. It was just for, uh, me and Natasha and we're going to keep that to ourselves. So, hey, you may think that we, uh, have no impulse control, but really we, we, I at least can edit. <laughs> so I told Natasha, she's my, she's my new Canadian best friend. Hopefully my other Canadian authors are not going to be offended by that. I, I'm so sorry. You can all be my Canadian best friends. She's just my newest Canadian best friend, okay? And yeah, looking forward to reading more books by Natasha in the future. And hopefully she'll come back on the podcast because laughter endorphins are a thing. Thank you so much to Natasha. Thank you as always to you, my listeners. I so very much appreciate you. If you are a fan of this podcast, hopefully you are since you're listening. If you could follow us on social media, like our posts, share our posts, comment on our posts, do all that wonderful thing, all those wonderful things that help us get our social media presence out there. That would be great. Even greater would be if you could subscribe to this podcast. Uh, then you'll get it right away and you'll always know when there's a new episode. 
And if you're really feeling generous, you can give us a five-star review. That would be awesome. And I would be very, very appreciative. Since this is November, I would be very grateful. There would be a lot of gratitude given for that review. Thank you again so much for joining me for this episode of the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Join me again next time for possibly less giggling, but definitely books. In the meantime, have a wonderful week and take time to get yourself lost in a good book. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.